Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining. We have a lot of news to get to in this episode. A lot has happened. The first thing is that Warren Buffett finally made a buy. We've been looking to him during this whole pandemic. Usually he's the guy to look to. What is he going to be buying during this downturn? Well, he finally did make a buy, and it's a large segment of the business, Dominion Energy, which is one of the companies that I own. So we're going to be taking a look at that, seeing my thoughts on it. We also have this news that TikTok the Chinese social media app that has been wildly successful all throughout the world, we might ban it here. We heard news that President Trump is considering banning this app. So I'm going to be looking into this and seeing why we would possibly ban TikTok. We also have an update on the coronavirus. We're going to be looking at the new daily cases as well as the fatal cases because they're drawing a little bit different of a picture. And then we have the news that Kanye West is running for president. President of the United States. Kanye West has announced his run for it. I didn't have anything to share with this no real insights or anything. I just wanted to point it out. Kanye West is running for president. Other than that, we have my portfolio. I'll be giving a full update on this. We'll be looking at how many dividends I was paid last month and how many dividends I was paid in quarter two of 2020. So during this whole pandemic, how much I earned in dividends. So we'll be going over all of that as well as some emails that I got that I think are really interesting questions. So I think this should be a fun episode. Okay, so first of all, let's do a quick portfolio update. The value is currently $101,000. We went above $100,000 and then we went back below it and now we're back above it again. So we've hit this landmark twice. We're back at $100,000 now. I think it's exciting to celebrate hitting these landmarks. I don't want to downplay it. It's a lot of money. It's exciting to hit. I think any landmark that you hit, like if you're just starting off and you hit $10,000, that's a fun landmark to celebrate. But the main goal of my portfolio is not to get to a certain value. That's one of the goals. I think it's fun to celebrate. But the main goal has always been to generate a stream of reliable, consistent, growing stream of passive income. That's been the goal, to create a stream of passive income. The way that I look at it is very simply, you have active income, which everybody knows about. That's you going to your job, clocking in, earning a paycheck. You have to work and you have to perform, otherwise you might get let go. That's your active stream of income. Everybody does that. If you go and you work in sales, you have to make sales. If you work as a waiter or waitress, you have to wait tables. If you're a programmer, you have to write code. Everybody has their stream of active income, and you're continually having to do that to earn an income. With passive income, it's completely different. This is money that quite literally you're earning passively in the background. You don't have to work for it. You're getting paid this money no matter what you do. You can spend the day at a beach, and you'll get paid dividends. You can spend the day working on other projects, and you'll get paid these dividends. That's what I'm trying to build up because I want to have enough ownership in these companies to completely replace or at least heavily subsidize my active income. Basically, I want to get out of the rat race. The rat race is this cycle of going to work, earning money, coming home and spending it, going to work, earning money, coming home and spending it, on and on and on and on. That goes on forever. People do that their entire lives and they never gain financial freedom. Now, I've been tracking my progress towards this goal of financial independence. This is literally a progress bar of me getting out of the rat race. That's the way that I look at it. Every time these numbers go up month by month, that's me getting closer to financial independence and not being so reliant on my active income. If I go and I look back in March of 2018, this was the first month that I actually earned any dividends or was paid any dividends, and I was paid $8.76, March of 2018. I was very excited about that at the time. And you can see the growth of this over time. As I reinvested dividends and continually deposited new money, continually reinvested dividends and bought companies that I thought were the best deals, this has grown over time to be a pretty big stream of income. Just last month, June of 2020, I was paid $340 in dividends in one month. That's a good amount of money to earn passively in one month. So this is getting reinvested back into my portfolio with that $340 in dividends I bought pretty much all JP Morgan. So I bought into another company that I think is a good deal right now that I think will pay me dividends in the future. So that's the route that I've been going. As this chart continues to go upward, I get closer and closer to financial independence. Now, my goal originally at the start of this year was to be earning over $400 a month in dividends by the end of 2020. Since then, we've had this pandemic. Obviously, some companies have suspended or lowered their dividends. So I'm not sure if I'm going to hit that, but I still think I'll be pretty close. We can also look at quarterly dividends. This is basically monthly dividends, but compiled into every three months. But you can clearly see the progress over time here. Last quarter, I made $788 in dividends. That was a record-breaking quarter for my portfolio. 
So even during this pandemic so far, the amount that I'm earning in dividends continues to increase. And I like to imagine this, if this is a company you're looking at and this is the growth of their revenue, this would be a company I'd wanna invest in. I'd want to invest in a company that's growing its revenue like this, but this is my portfolio and the amount of revenue my portfolio is producing over time. It's paying me out more and more as I continue to reinvest this money. So that's the update as of now. I have changed around the allocation of some of my holdings. So if you're interested in seeing that, in the description of this video, there's gonna be a link called View My Main Portfolio. You'll be able to click on that, open it up, and then you can look at all the different changes I've made. So you can look at that if you're interested. Okay, moving on, let's get to some news. The first item is a big one. Warren Buffett has finally made a purchase. That's news that people have been looking for. When is he gonna buy something during this pandemic? So that's news in and of itself. But I think the bigger news, and at least more perplexing, is what he purchased. Dominion Energy, which is a utility company, it's one that I own in my portfolio, they sold off a large portion of their business to Warren Buffett. They divested from their whole gas assets. This made up 25% of their operating earnings. So this is 25% of the earnings of the company. They sold it off to Warren Buffett. I've tried to look at this. I've tried to find out from the perspective of Dominion why this was a good deal for them. And I have to be honest, I don't think this was a good deal. Any way that I look at it, I don't really like the deal. I wish that they didn't do it. I don't think that it served shareholders that well. So let's go ahead and look in why I don't really think this is a good deal. First of all, let's look at what the actual agreement was. So this is written up by Dominion Energy. So this is from their perspective. They have kind of a positive spin on it, but I'll go ahead and read it. They say, Dominion Energy has executed a definitive agreement to sell gas transmission and storage assets, including more than 7,700 miles of natural gas storage and transmission pipelines and about 900 billion cubic feet of gas storage that the company currently operates. To an affiliate of Berkshire Hathaway Energy, in a transaction valued at approximately 9.7 billion, including the assumption of about 5.7 billion of existing indebtedness, which will reduce Dominion Energy's total leverage. The buyer will also make cash payments of approximately 4 billion to Dominion Energy upon closing. So that's the basic summary of this deal. They're selling off these cash generating assets that really weren't problematic. These were good assets that Dominion earned. Now Warren Buffett's gonna own them. They're deleveraging a little bit. I guess that's good. They got $4 billion in cash, but get this, they're using that for share buybacks. If you want to know how I feel about share buybacks, you can go and reference my video where I say why I hate share buybacks. So that's what they're doing with the free cash. They're not investing it back in their business. They're doing share buybacks. They're deleveraging a little bit. And then on top of that, we can look at the dividend. The dividend is being cut by 33%. It says the company now expects to target an approximate 65% payout ratio to be effective upon completion of this transaction. So I guess they're lowering their payout ratio a little bit. It went from 85% to 65. That's a good thing, but the dividend's being lowered 33%. And then Dominion adds in here that they're going to be able to grow their dividend at a faster rate, approximately 6% per year. This represents a significant increase from the previous long-term dividend per share growth of 2.5%. My response to that is who cares? If you're going to grow the dividend faster, but you're just going to end up cutting it by 33% and starting over, why do we care about the dividend growth? The dividend growth needs to be sustainable. I'm looking for companies that can sustainably grow their dividend, which means they increase the amount that they're paying you with a stable payout ratio. So that's what I'm looking for. I, I don't see this as a positive thing. Cutting your dividend by 33% and then advertising that you can grow it at a faster rate doesn't make much sense to me. Then we look at their write-up of why they're doing this, their justification for it. They say, quote, this transaction represents another significant step in our evolution as a company, allowing us to focus even more on fulfilling utility customer needs and positioning us for a bright and increasingly sustainable future. So this last part right there, the bright and increasingly sustainable future. And that's the most important part. If you read through all of this from Dominion Energy, this release that they did of why they're, they're doing this, they're wanting to be a pure play, state regulated, sustainability focused utility company. Meaning they're wanting to get out of the dirty natural gas oil business. They wanna be an ESG friendly business. So that's the positive side of it, is they're, they're moving towards a, a brighter future, more renewable. But in the process, they have gutted 25% of their business and sold it off to Berkshire. They have lowered their dividend by 33%, and everything has been reset backwards. We can even look at the stock. Dominion Energy is down about 11% since this deal was made. 
That shows how investors are looking at it. They're scratching their head, wondering why Dominion Energy would do this. And their reasoning for it doesn't make a lot of sense, that they want to be a state-regulated, sustainability-focused. They could do that without selling off all their assets that are producing 25% of their operating income. There's other ways to do that. So doing this deal, lowering your debt a little bit, but then spending the proceeds of the sale on share buybacks... That's something that I think most investors are not going to be happy about. If we look at Berkshire's, their stock is up maybe 1%, a little over 1% from this deal. Of course, Berkshire is a much bigger business, so this is a smaller deal in comparison to it. But you can see the reaction of this. I think that Warren Buffett got the better end of this deal. He bought really productive assets. These storage and transportation of natural gas is important. And in this type of regulatory environment, it's harder to build these facilities. So new competitors will have a difficult time replicating what Dominion Energy just decided to sell off. So I think overall, not a good deal for the Dominion Energy shareholder. As far as my investment in the company, I plan on just holding it. I'm probably going to rearrange these so that Dominion is not my biggest holding in the utility sector. But I have about 36 shares of Dominion. I'm still in the green even after the 11% sell-off. And I plan on holding these shares. Now, the fact that they sold off a huge productive part of their business and they're spending a lot of the proceeds for share buybacks makes me question some things about the company's management. Whether they're being compensated based off of earning per share metrics or things like that, I'll be looking at that in the future. But right now I plan on holding my current stake in it, not really adding too much to it. Okay, next in the news, we have TikTok. This is everybody's favorite social media app, the short video app. It's one of my wife's favorites. She sends me these TikToks all the time. But this company has a lot of controversy. And basically, it's because it's owned by a Chinese company. That's the reason why. We already have a lot of concerns about social media companies, just with people like Mark Zuckerberg owning them. But he's American. So at least there's that. Now we have concerns about social media companies being owned by China which doesn't have the same type of protections for people's privacy. So this has been an ongoing controversy with TikTok. It says here that the social media sensation will pull its app out of Hong Kong amid concerns of the new national security laws. So they're pulling out of Hong Kong. There's other news like this, that India is banning TikTok. They're doing this as part of political reasons. They're having all these disputes with China and they want to ban the company even after TikTok made a lot of investments to grow in India. So this is a major blow to TikTok. And then we have news that the US may be banning TikTok. This would be huge news. If we banned a social media company this big, it would be everywhere online. That would be breaking front page news. So just a rumor of this is enough to make the news. Australia is considering banning TikTok, and now we hear news that the US is as well. So let me go ahead and look at the actual clip of where Mike Pompeo suggested that the U.S. may be looking at this. Mike Pompeo went on Fox News, and this is where the subject of TikTok came up. Oh, your viewers should know we're taking this very seriously. We're, we're, we're certainly looking at it. We've worked on this very issue for a long time, whether it was the problems of having Huawei technology in your infrastructure. We've gone all over the world, and we're making real progress getting that out. Uh, we uh, declared ZTE a danger to American national security. We've done all of these things with respect to Chinese apps on people's cell phones. I can assure you the United States will get this one right, too, Laura. I don't, want to, get out and, I don't want to get out in front of the president, but it's something we're looking at. So there he says that they're looking at the potential ban of Chinese social media apps, which TikTok would definitely fall under. Now, here's the reason that they're considering the ban. Would you recommend that people download that app on their phones uh, tonight, tomorrow, anytime uh, currently? Only if you want your private information in the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. That is the concern that everybody lists off as why they're considering a ban of TikTok. That's the reason that Australia right now is saying they're considering it. That's the reason that India said that they're doing it is because of security concerns. They're saying they don't want their data to be in the hands of the Chinese. Now, I will say, I don't think that that's a great reason. I don't think that TikTok cares at all about secretly obtaining your data and using it for nefarious reasons. I don't think that's why. I think that they're a big company and they want to be a bigger company and make a lot of money. That's the reason that TikTok's trying to spread throughout the world. Not because they want to secretly use your data, it's because they want to make money. That's the reason why. They want to make money. And having you use their platform allows you to be monetized and they can make money that way. Now, if you're looking for a natural reason to ban TikTok, something I think would be a natural good reason to ban it, I think the better reason would be just to have a level playing field with China. They have no qualms about banning US tech companies. They've literally banned Google. They've banned YouTube. They've banned Facebook and Wikipedia, Blogspot, 
Instagram, Twitch, Twitter, Tumblr, Pinterest, Amazon, and so on and so forth. They have banned hundreds of U.S. companies from having access to their markets, but yet we allow them to have companies like TikTok come in and saturate our market. I'm not sure why we allow them to do that. So I think this is a much more compelling reason. If we're looking at banning Chinese social media companies, it should be on the ground that things are going to be reciprocated. If they're not going to allow us to have access to their market, why should we allow them to have access to ours? So I think if the U.S. did that, and if Europe did that, if India did that, if Australia did that, if all these countries and areas started banning Chinese companies until they allowed us to have access, I think it might force China to have a more open and level playing field of a marketplace. So I don't think that we're going to ban TikTok anytime soon. I think that would cause too big of an uproar, but it is interesting following this news. Maybe we could because we did put some really harsh regulations on Huawei, which was another Chinese firm. So we'll see what happens, but that's where we are right now. Now, I want to do a quick update on the coronavirus before we jump into emails. Just looking at the new daily cases, we see that we have a huge spike over the past couple months. This has been concerning a lot of states like Florida, uh, Texas, California. They've totally halted or even reverted plans of reopening their state. So not good for the stock market, not good for the economy, but it's a precaution they're taking because they're seeing these big spikes in cases. Now, the interesting thing is if we toggle over and look at the fatal cases, it paints a different picture. The amount of fatal cases continues to decline, and the last recorded day we had was 244 in all of the U.S. That's one of the lowest days recorded since the beginning of this. So there's some thoughts on why this is. A lot of people say, well, these new daily cases, it takes two or three weeks until they actually show up in the fatal cases. That might be the case, so maybe this will spike back upwards. There's some other thoughts like we're just testing more. You can look at the daily tests in the U.S., and we are testing more than we were before. We're testing about 400,000 people a day. So we are doing a lot more tests. There's other thoughts like maybe the people getting infected now are much younger and they're less likely to die from it. There's all these different explanations, but the real truth is we don't know. There's a lot of different factors at play. We're just going to have to wait and see. So we'll keep checking on this, but hopefully this trend with this graph continues and the fatal cases continue to decline. That would be the hope. Okay, let's get into some emails. Joseph at josephcarlsonshow.com is the email address if you want to send in any questions or thoughts you have. The first one is from Marcus. He says, hi, Joseph. First of all, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for all the effort that goes into your channel and the content you're creating. I've been watching your show pretty much since the beginning, and I'm very excited for each new episode. I appreciate that, Marcus. Um, he says, to see your portfolio and progress at such a pace has really motivated me to fund my own portfolio quite aggressively following mainly your strategy of passive income, although I have invested in some growth stocks as well. I'm happy to report that I have just hit 70,000 euros since I am in Germany. Yeah, I got a lot of people pointing out that I said euros when it should have been pounds. So I got a lot of comments pointing that out. But uh, you say, this is a big thing for me since I'm only 22 years old. So thank you very much for the advice and the motivation and thinking patterns that you have provided throughout your videos. Well, I appreciate that, Marcus. So you say, however, the main reason why I'm writing you is because I have a question regarding your last video. I totally get your train of thought and your arguments for buying shares of large banks, and I've spent a bit of time analyzing JPM stock as well. I agree that they have a strong balance sheet, a very well diversified business, and a large advantage due to their size. Basically, they are as solid as a bank can be in the current situation. But I wonder about banking in general. As the increasing number of fintech companies enters the market and competes with the old banking system, take Square for example. They make it extraordinarily easy for small business owners to allow transactions via credit card and are becoming popular handling transactions for lower fees than banks like JPM. Additionally, they offer services like bank accounts, credit and credit cards, and so on. Another example could be your own broker, M1 or N26. I'm not suggesting that either of these companies will be able to fulfill the full variety of services that JPM offers in the near future, but the services that can be automated and fully digitalized already can be offered by these kind of companies. And it seems like especially the young customers are open to this kind of change. These changes in banking sectors remind me of a quote from Bill Gates, in which he says that we need banking, but we do not need banks. I would greatly appreciate to hear your thoughts on this matter and hear your take on the effects of the increasing popularity of fintechs on the large banks. Okay, Marcus, I think this is a good email, really good question. What about all these fintech companies? You mentioned companies like Square. There's even ones like PayPal and Venmo. 
pretty much every tech company is wanting to offer some type of money service, some type of banking service. And you mentioned even M1 Finance, the broker that I use has M1 Spend and M1 Borrow. These are all banking services that these companies are offering. And sometimes they are better than the traditional banks. They're better than JP Morgan. So isn't this a big threat? Why am I still investing in JP Morgan if other companies are offering the same thing or even better options of it? So first of all, I want to give a scale of how big JP Morgan is. Most people, when they're interacting with banks, they're just interacting with the retail consumer side of it. For JP Morgan, they have about 40% of their revenue being the consumer retail side. They also have corporate investment banking, they have commercial banking, they have asset wealth management. So the consumer and community banking makes up $52 billion of revenue. They have corporate investment banking that makes up $36 billion. They have commercial banking, which makes up $9 billion. And then they have asset wealth management, which makes up about $14 billion. So that's the different parts of their bank overall. Now, just to give you an idea of scale, JP Morgan manages about $2.9 trillion in assets under management. Right now, that's how much they manage. M1 Finance just celebrated reaching $1 billion. That's the difference in scale, $2.9 trillion to about $1 billion. So even though a lot of these fintech companies, you're seeing them every day, they're getting used often, JP Morgan and these large banks manage a huge amount of money. On top of that, they offer a lot of corporate and investment banking services that smaller fintechs really can't offer. Now, another thing I think is worth mentioning, you bring up M1 Finance offering banking services. I don't talk about these features that much. I mostly focus on the investment tab, but they do have M1 Borrow and M1 Spend. M1 Spend is like the debit account for M1 Finance. You have a debit account that earns you 1% cash back as well as 1% interest. And then you have M1 Borrow, which I think is even a better feature. If you have the M1 Plus, they lower the interest rate that you can borrow by 1.5%. So Right now, if you have M1 Plus, it's at 2%, which is incredibly low. I'm eligible to borrow up to $35,000 at 2%. That is a really cool service to have. So this is margin. This is borrowed and my portfolio is the collateral. But regardless, having a line of credit of $35,000 at a 2% interest rate is really, really nice to have. So these are all cool features. And you mentioned that this is in competition of banks. One thing I want to point out is that M1 Finance does use a bank to offer these services. These accounts are furnished by Lincoln Savings Bank. So they're partnered with a traditional bank to offer these services. And that's the case with a lot of these companies. A lot of tech companies don't have the time to build out traditional banking services and the whole structure behind it. So instead of doing that, they just partner with the old fashioned traditional banks. You can see the same thing with Apple. They partnered with Goldman Sachs to build out their banking portion. They're not doing it by themselves. So uh, yes, there are a lot of competition, but even a lot of this competition still needs traditional banking services. The last thing I'll mention on this subject is that fintech companies and tech companies in general are not the only companies that invest in technology. A lot of non-tech companies do substantial investments in technology. For instance, JP Morgan invests $11 billion per year in technology. They say that it fuels a team of over 50,000 technologists. And it mentions that the company also recently invested in partnerships with high profile startups, including OnDeck and Roostify to the tune of 600 million. So this is something that I think you're gonna see more of. These big banks are either going to build out technology themselves, and when they really can't compete with smaller fintechs, they're either gonna partner with them or they're gonna do acquisitions. So I can see more of that happening. JP Morgan is a really good investment bank. When they see good opportunities to buy companies, I think they'll do that. Now on a related comment, the Marquise says, Eisman is overrated. He's talking about Steve Eisman, the guy that was short US banks during the great financial crisis. He says he's been wrong seemingly as much as he's been right. One good call during the great financial crisis doesn't make him a guru. I agree with that. He was way off on his Tesla call. He was short Tesla, and this was before it completely rocketed up. So that was a bad call. Now, in his defense, Tesla is a speculative growth stock that is trading off of nothing that can be justified with fundamentals. It's just trading off of future predictions and future growth, which is fine. That's something that you can buy the stock based off of those reasons. But that's not really how Steve Eisman, I think, was looking at the stock. He's looking at it off of the fundamentals, which I think works a lot better with banks. If you just look at his record on banks, he was correct on the great financial crisis. So that was one good call that he did. And then right afterwards, he was short European banks. 
If you look at Deutsche Bank, he's been short that for about 10 years and that stock has fallen like a rock. So that's another good call on banks. And now he's saying that US banks are completely fine right now and that Canadian banks are in trouble if they go through another credit cycle. So those are his calls concerning banks and I think that he has a lot better record there. He's basically made two correct calls and then two of them are outstanding. So we'll see what happens with the other two, but with the first two calls he's made on banks, he's been spot on. And I do want to mention that Steve Eisman is not the only reason I'm investing in JP Morgan. I think his input is good on the subject, but there's a lot of other reasons why I'm investing in it. I haven't followed him into other investments he's done. So I didn't short Tesla. I didn't short European banks. I've been looking at US financials for a while, and I just think that banks are a good deal. Whether that turns out to be correct or not, time will tell. But right now, I think that JP Morgan's selling at a pretty good deal. Mixed Film says, how do you learn so much about these kinds of topics? This is a, a funny question. The real truth is, everything is on the internet. Everything that you really can learn about any of these subjects is on the internet available right now. So it's the world's biggest library. Everybody has access to this information. The difficult part is really studying it and learning about it, putting in the time to. But you could do the same thing, not even for finance. You could learn about basically any subject. If you wanted to become a proficient senior level programmer, there's enough information right now on the internet for free to do that without signing up for any service, without paying for anything that are special courses or monthly anything, you could learn how to become a senior level programmer just off the information available for free right now. That's the truth. The thing that holds most people back from learning about these different subjects, whether it's programming or finance or culinary, learning how to cook, or any other subject is just the amount of time it takes to learn about it. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of consistent research and, and time invested. So that's a difficult part, but everything is really available on the internet right now. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and end this episode there. I appreciate everybody that listens and supports the show, shares it with friends, that subscribes, all that good stuff. I will check in with you guys next time.